Thanks very much. And our next speaker, final speaker for the today's session and for today is Dr. Jonathan Kimmelman from McGill. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, my focus is gonna be primarily on cancer. My talk's gonna divide into four parts. And I wanna start by talking about what I think of as uh, the paradox of personalized or precision medicine and why this may be creating more pressure and demand uh, and burden, in a sense, on the way we do preclinical research. So the project of personalized medicine or precision medicine, whatever you want to call it, is primarily aimed at taking heterogeneous populations and breaking them up in, uh, that have highly variable response to drug and to breaking them up into various strata that have more homogeneous responses to drug. And uh, this is a you know, wonderful project. It's a project that has returned many dividends, uh, particularly in the realm of cancer. Uh, but it's a project that in some way uh, I want to suggest is chasing its tail and uh, that may again be uh, creating a very heavy demand for uh, and uh, expectation about the way we use preclinical evidence. And I want to suggest there are five ways that there's a paradox that's sort of built in to the mission of precision medicine. The first is a really obvious one, which is that the minute we take large heterogeneous populations and divide them into various strata, we are stuck with smaller populations, which by definition, because they have lower statistical power, we're dealing with a higher degree of variance in terms of characterizing the properties of a drug uh, in that population. And that means that if we're dealing with really small, finer grained uh, strata of populations, uh, we may not necessarily be able to rely on the standard model of the randomized control trial to make uh, clinical uh, inferences. Ultimately, we may be needing to combine different forms of evidence. The second major challenge or paradox that's built into uh, precision medicine is the notion of edges and boundaries. Uh, the goal, of course, is to develop diagnostic techniques that can, we can allow to stratify patients, but anytime you have a diagnostic technique, typically you're dealing with some kind of a cut point on that diagnostic, and of course, uh, as we know with genes, uh, you might have a, a variation of alleles, you might characterize uh, with a, a high degree of uh, clarity or resolution uh, the response of an individual with, uh, to a drug with a given allele, but you may have a lot of uncertainty about these various other alleles. And so the number of different diagnostics you use, the layers of diagnostics you're putting on top, are always raising questions about the cut points uh, and about uh, the uh, generalizability of that precision medicine technique to other similar but ne not necessarily identical uh, patient populations. So again, we have this proliferation of imprecision in some ways by virtue of the fact that we have boundaries or edges with the ways that we classify patients into finer and finer grained strata. The third issue is one that was talked about a little bit, I think, in the second session, and it's the issue of algorithms and interpretation of data. Um, there is, to my knowledge at least, one, only one uh, published randomized controlled trial testing algorithms uh, to match patients to treatments in the context of cancer. It was the SHIVA trial, or I think it's supposed to be pronounced SHIVA trial. Um, it was unfortunately a negative trial, but the interesting thing uh, about this, uh, uh, this trial is uh, the question of um, what kinds of information and inputs are used to inform the algorithms that we use uh, to match drugs to patients in the context of cancer or elsewhere. Uh, this is a publication by a group in Canada that has explicitly decided to reject any kind of preclinical evidence in their uh, patient matching algorithms because of concerns about reproducibility. But that's hardly the consensus view. If we look to, for example, a consensus statement uh, issued by ASCO and a few other professional societies, they classify uh, preclinical evidence as grade D, but still uh, clinically actionable in the absence of other higher forms of evidence. So here there's clear endorsement of use of preclinical and animal studies to inform uh, patient treatment. Um, here's another example. This is a study that used whole exome sequencing uh, to uh, uh, identify clinically actionable uh, sequences uh, in, in, in patients with cancer. And you see that the most frequent uh, category of uh, clinically actionable mutations uh, are informed by level D evidence. This is a, a preclinical evidence. Um, okay, so that's, so that's another way in which there's uh, precision medicine maybe sort of Creating, creating greater demands for uh, preclinical evidence. The fourth issue is the issue about the rapid evolution of our knowledge and the techniques. 
By techniques, I mean the techniques that we use to diagnose patients, the diagnostic techniques themselves may be undergoing evolution, uh, but also the algorithms we use uh, uh, may be undergoing evolution by virtue of the fact that we're always accruing more information about the properties of, uh, of, of, of various drugs or, or treatment approaches. So going back to the Shiva, it's a wonderful study, uh, a negative result, unfortunately, but by the time that this study had been completed, probably the algorithm for matching patients to the drugs is already outdated. So you never really have any stable ground to stand on in virtue of the fact that the algorithms that are being validated in trials are undergoing evolution while they're actually uh, being tested. And the fifth issue is one that is kind of uh, pulls together all these earlier points, which is the challenge of integrating data sets. In non-precision medicine, we have the virtue of relying on trials that all are uh, fairly large clinical trials, uh, uh, you know, low degree of variance because they're, they're, they're large trials. Um, and ideally, we can synthesize or pool fairly similar kinds of data sets into a meta-analysis to form a judgment about the clinical utility of a treatment. That, luxury, that is not a luxury that we necessarily have available to us in the context of precision medicine, where we may be pooling small trials and trying to aggregate or interpret them in light of outcomes in preclinical research, other uh, studies, trials testing similar but non-identical drugs or trials testing identical drugs with different diagnostic techniques to match patients. And so one of the challenges here is that we have to create or uh, develop different ways to aggregate information from disparate sources, something that's really uh, less familiar to the practice of non-precision medicine. I just want to mention two other uh, really, really quick points that I think in precision medicine are creating pressures on preclinical research. Uh, there's this category of clinical trials, these platform trials where we have these arms that are being added or closed. Uh, the basic idea of the platform trial is to create this infrastructure that is constantly accruing new hypotheses to test and closing them out depending on whether they show activity or they show futility. Well, if you invest in creating a large infrastructure like a platform study that has to be running continuously, you're always going to need to be fueling that platform trial with new hypotheses to test. And I think that also creates some pressure on making sure that we have interesting hypotheses to feed into those platform uh, studies, uh, hypotheses that uh, have an adequate risk-benefit balance for the patients who are going to be entering uh, into them. And of course, we also talked uh, a little bit here at this meeting about the avatar or about the uh, you know, patient-derived xenografts. This is another area where uh, there's a tighter coupling of preclinical evidence uh, and uh, experimentation with clinical uh, judgment. I think in medicine, we have this fiction that uh, we've got preclinical evidence and we have this really good filter between spurious preclinical findings and clinical practice, and that's clinical trials. So, you know, Drugs, we get uh, interesting activity in a preclinical study. They get put into phase one, phase two, phase three studies. That filters out spurious findings from preclinical. Patients are protected from spurious findings in preclinical. And that really is a, has always been a fiction, but I think it's especially a fiction in the context of precision medicine. A non-precision example uh, is the example of a drug called bixarotene, a drug that showed activity uh, uh, the drug that is uh, licensed for the treatment of T-cell lymphoma, it showed activity in a science article against Alzheimer's disease on that basis. There was some discussion about trying to actually use this drug off-label in Alzheimer's patients. Just an interesting footnote, to my knowledge, this study actually was not able to be reproduced. Uh, but uh, this is also a recurrent theme in the context of precision medicine. Here's a publication. Uh, looking at uh, pediatric solid tumors to where uh, the researchers were looking to identify clinically actionable mutations uh, in a sample of about 100 uh, uh, pediatric solid tumors. Uh, and they classified the clinically actual mutations on the level of evidence. Uh, what you see here is that uh, the most, uh, so only 30 out of 100 tumors showed clinically actual mutations. Uh, but most of the clinically actual mutations were deemed actionable on the basis of preclinical or even level five, which was expert opinion. I'm not sure exactly what expert opinion means, but anyway, without preclinical. Okay. And it, it's also very easy to go to the literature and to find lots of case reports, almost all of them positive, by the way, uh, that, uh, that show that a drug can be used off label uh, successfully to treat uh, you know, an individual patient on the basis of some kind of preclinical study. So I think in precision medicine, we have this coupling, this sort of, you don't necessarily have to go through clinical trials to get to clinical practice. And I think this creates some concerns, or at least it creates some real pressures on getting the preclinical evidence uh, exactly right.
Okay, the second part, I want to go through really, really quickly some factors that I think uh, uh, challenge our ability to make uh, clinically generalizable inferences uh, from preclinical evidence. If you think about any kind of preclinical study uh, or any kind of research program, you can divide it into sort of three cycles, and there were threats that are introduced in each of the different steps uh, within this cycle. Uh, with respect to design, Uli already talked a lot about uh, some of the various threats. There are any number of different variables that can confound our ability to measure a real treatment effect. Uh, internal validity refers to our ability to measure uh, an actual relationship, cause and effect relationship between a drug and some kind of a disease response. In cancer, it's extremely rare to find implementation of measures to uh, neutralize those threats to internal validity. So for example, in my own systematic review of preclinical studies for serafinib, 0% of studies in at least my review used any kind of outcome assessment blinding. Construct validity, at least in my definition, refers to the concordance between the experimental system and the clinical scenarios they're intended to simulate. Uh, again, in cancer, we've heard about this already, uh, high reliance on juvenile mice, uh, female mice. Uh, m most mice are immunosuppressed in the context of cancer. And external validity refers to the robustness or the ability of a cause and effect relationship to withstand perturbations in the experimental system. And again, in my own systematic review of serafinib, we see that most malignancies that were shown to respond to serafinib were only validated in a single, uh, sy a single uh, system. Very rare do you find uh, four or five different systems used to validate uh, a drug's activity in cancer against a uh, malignancy. Reporting has already been talked about a bit as well. Uh, there's different kinds of reporting threats. I'm just going to mention really quickly the problem of uh, non-publication. Uh, 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 there's a you know, tendency to, to publish positive studies, to not publish negative. This is a real problem in the context of precision medicine, I, I fear. In our own study of serafinib, we found that if you statistically correct for non-published uh, preclinical studies of serafinib, the effect size, the mean effect size, drops by about 37%. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in this work, it was published in Cancer Research, I think now two years ago, and it was done by my, uh, my uh, master's student, uh, James Matina. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the challenge of uptake, something that people don't really talk a lot about, but I think really matters a lot in this context. So obviously, uh, if you do an experiment, the experiment is only valid insofar as you have interpreted uh, or made accurate clinical inferences about what that experiment shows. So an experiment can be a completely fine experiment, but if you're interpreting it wrong, then, uh, then there's a problem. And I think uptake is the missing link in the discussion we have about reproducibility. My own team has tried to actually systematically study uh, the quality of uh, the inferences that we make in the context of preclinical research. Probably people here are aware of the Reproducibility Project Cancer Biology. This is an initiative to take uh, several high-profile cancer studies that were published in high-impact uh, uh, journals and to reproduce them in independent laboratories. What we did is we piggybacked on that uh, reproducibility project and asked a series of experts in cancer biology who had experts, expertise in the individual studies in the reproducibility project to predict whether or not the studies would reproduce using uh, two different measures, whether the studies would reproduce the statistical sig significance as well as the effect size. So our study looked at 138 uh, different individuals who are identified as having expertise in the areas of, those pre of the six preclinical studies that we studied. We also did the study in trainees. Uh, and so what we asked them is to provide a number between zero and 100% uh, that the studies would reproduce by those two criteria. 66% means that they were betting two to one odds of the study reproducing. And what you see, these are histograms of people's predictions, and what you see is that people were fairly optimistic. They were closer to 100% that studies would reproduce their statistical significance. They were a little bit more pessimistic, but there was still quite a bit of optimism, a lot of uncertainty at 50% with respect to reproducing the effect sizes. If you actually score the accuracy using a technique called the Breyer score, uh, the accuracy of people's predictions, with Breyer scores, the best predictors will have a score of zero, and the worst predictors will have a score of one. So you see with respect to, and this line right here, this is a benchmark that represents what you would score if you just guessed 50% every time you were asked a question. What you can see is that for significance, most people did a lot worse than just guessing 50%. 
Uh, and a lot of people did worse uh, with effect sizes, not quite as many people. But if you combine these, generally speaking, expert scientists perform worse than just guessing 50% about whether studies uh, will reproduce, at least in the six studies uh, that we looked at using the techniques uh, that we looked at. Now, discouragingly, we wanted to look at whether there were properties of scientists that were better at predicting whether studies would reproduce or not. Uh, unfortunately, what we found was that people who claimed to have greater confidence in their predictions did not necessarily do any better than people who had low confidence in their predictions. If anything, highly confident scientists did worse in their predictions. People who claimed to have more expertise in the individual studies that we were asking them about didn't do any better than people who claimed to have less expertise. The one variable that's a little bit suggestive, it's a small study, so it needs to be reproduced, is the H index. People who had higher H indices seem to be a little bit more jaundiced with respect to the likelihood that studies would reproduce. Consequently, people who had higher H indices tended to actually have more accurate predictions. H <coughs> index, for those of you who don't know it, is a, is a measure of uh, scientists' uh, productivity. And that's published in PLOS Biology, in case you're interested, and it was uh, led by my postdoc, uh, Danny Benjamin. Let me now try to sort of pull this together and offer a couple uh, recommendations for how I think uh, we might want to try to approach preclinical research in the era of precision medicine. So my first recommendation is, you know, there's all sorts of different ways of doing preclinical research, and there are good reasons to have fairly permissive standards for preclinical research in an exploratory context. But the minute we're talking about trying to use preclinical findings to inform clinical decision making, I think we really have a strong demand for what I'm calling clinical grade preclinical evidence. By that, I mean studies ought to have a more kind of confirmatory structure. Uli and I actually wrote a paper a few years ago about describing exactly what we mean by exploratory <laughs> preclinical studies in contrast, uh, confirmatory in contrast with exploratory. Uh, but in essence, uh, what we mean is that these studies ought to be powered a priori. They ought to implement measures like blinding and randomization. The hypotheses ought to be pre-specified, and there ought to be some mechanism to prospectively register these in a database so that we can protect against uh, publication bias. My second uh, recommendation is that we really need to do something to address the quality of the reporting, and I mean this both in the context of preclinical as well as in clinical. In my own research, we've looked at the fraction of trials for drugs that don't get FDA approval, the fraction of those trials that get published. And what we find is that only 37% of trials of drugs that don't get FDA approval get published within five years of their completion of enrollment, in contrast with 75% for drugs that are licensed. Now again, if you go back to the, what I was saying earlier about the need to integrate different kinds of data sets to form inferences about the utility of a drug in a patient population, the fact that we can't rely on large populations if we have these finer and finer grained strata of patients, we're losing a huge amount of information from these unsuccessful drug development trajectories. To me, it's unconscionable that we tolerate uh, this degree of non-publication in the context of drug development. Um, also an issue, obviously, with preclinical, I've talked about that. Uh, obviously, we have, are dealing with a highly biased data sets if we're trying to go to the literature and to look at the properties of a drug uh, against a particular uh, patient stratum using animals. And my third recommendation is getting back to that issue of uptake. So I think we need to think about ways of improving the, our ability to interpret and make inferences using uh, preclinical evidence. This is a small study that looked at the ability of garden variety oncologists to make recommendations on clinical actionability in precision medicine context that were concordant with expert judgments at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And essentially what you see is uh, a finding that uh, physicians may have a less stringent definition of actionability than expert curators. Well, that's a concern, given that, given that by definition experts are rare, it's mostly going to be those physicians that are making the bedside uh, decisions. There's a large literature on how to improve the ability of people to make predictions, to make inferences, et cetera. And uh, I'm just going to say really quickly that what, one of the themes that comes up in this literature is that the best kinds of decision and prediction contexts are contexts in which the human is combined with the machine. And I think we need to really think increasingly about ways to improve the human interface with the machine in order to make good clinical judgments in the context of precision medicine. And they're essentially in that sort of human machine interface, there are two different ways we can intervene to improve the accuracy and the quality of the judgments uh, that are made with respect to clinical utility. 
The first is you can improve the decision maker. You can, uh, you can train the decision maker on the content uh, of the preclinical research. You can also give them cognitive training. There are certain kinds of heuristics or biases that people can be trained to avoid or to utilize to make better uh, decisions. A third point is that you can give them feedback. Weather forecasters are extremely good at predicting the weather, contrary to popular belief. And part of the reason why they're so effective is because they get feedback every day on how accurate their forecasts were. We don't necessarily have that system set up in medicine. If we did have that system in medicine, we would have a mechanism where pe people could improve their ability to interpret evidence and make clinical judgments uh, in light of it. The other point where you can intervene, and this is my second to last slide, I have three seconds left, uh, is uh, improving the machine. And here I think, you know, thinking about ways that uh, to facilitate an interface of a human being with a data set. Uh, the data set or the, uh, the machine needs to have better evidence put into it. It also needs to have more evidence call, that's noisy evidence called from it or removed, evidence that is distracting. I think getting back to one of those algorithms I mentioned from the University of Toronto, uh, where they excluded preclinical, at this point that actually might be a prudent policy given the amount of noisiness in the preclinical evidence uh, that we have right now uh, in cancer. So I'm just going to close by thanking uh, the two uh, sources of funding that I've had to think about these issues in precision medicine. Thank you.